Hi guys, welcome back to 20 Questions With, and today's guest has been a stunt driver, F1 driver coach, and even a racing driver himself. Welcome to Sam Marlocknan. How are you, Sam? I'm very good, thank you. How are you, Becca? I'm not too bad. Thank you for joining me on my little sort of interview series. More than welcome. <laughs> so are That's you right. prepared for the quick buy round? Let's go. Good to go. Okay. Hopefully nothing too strenuous. So, first question. What is your favourite car? It's a, that's a loaded question because <laughs> people get very emotional about that. It, it, it all depends on what I'm using it for. Okay. So is it my favorite track car, my favorite car for going on a journey in, my favorite car for rallying, my favorite car for doing tricks. So I can't, there's no one car that does all the things I love. Hmm. So Let's yeah, it's track hard track. to pick. Say again? Let's go with favorite track car. Favorite track car. Because I'm biased and I did some work with it, would be the 675LT McLaren. Fantastic. I just thought that was a pretty, pretty cool car. Definitely. And your favourite track? Spa. Spa. Cats or dogs? Oh, can't answer that, but dogs probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we rescue a lot of dogs, so it has oh. to be dogs. Yeah, I'm happy. I'm definitely a fully dog person for me. So if you were to go to a restaurant, what would be your go-to three-course meal? I'm really boring and my wife hates this. I don't really care about food very much. It's more like fuel to me. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, but if I, I do love pulled pork, so that would be it. Definitely. And then I love chicken and sweet corn soup. I'm going in, in, in the wrong order now, but, <laughs> and then I love, I'm not really a dessert guy, really. Cheesecake if I had to pick, I would Cheesecake. say. Okay, okay. And your most inspirational driver? Kimmy. Kimmy Raikkonen. Kimmy or <laughs> Sebastian Loeb. They're both kind of heroes of mine. And if you weren't doing motorsport, what other sport would you do? Uh, MMA. MMA. Mm. And are you a morning or evening person? Definitely evening. <laughs> Bit more awake. <laughs> Always more awake. And what is your go-to hobby apart from motorsport? Uh, hobby's a funny one. Martial arts is my main extra curriculum, but then that kind of leads into a lot of the work I do. So you can't really class that as a hobby. Um, golf, I guess, would be the main one then, <laughs> if it had to be a hobby. From one extreme to the other, from fighting to <laughs> golf. I, I get angry on the golf course too, so that kind of balances it. <laughs> and what is the scariest thing you've ever done? Scariest thing? Um... <laughs> I guess scariest situations I've found myself in or something I've had to do. Let's go something you've had to do. Ooh, there's been quite a few. <laughs> I just recently, I had to have a crash on a film set in January and uh, we weren't too sure how the truck was gonna hold up. Oh so they, had, they put me in knee pads and because I was in a costume, uh, I couldn't wear a helmet and it was a kind of a, Will it, won't it crumble? But um, yeah, it seemed to be okay. So that was nerve wracking. Yeah, I just had to dive through a window I couldn't fit through. So that was fun. That was quite scary. <laughs> so yeah, it's kind of swings and roundabouts. <laughs> At least you're here in one piece. That's what matters. There you go. <laughs> and last but not least, what is the one word you'd use to describe yourself? Clumsy. Clumsy. <laughs> <laughs> Works well with stunt driving then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's brilliant. So you've made it through the quick fire round. Woo. Not too scary? <laughs> scary enough. That's up there now on the list of the other ones. So. <laughs> Especially for this week. <laughs> so we're going to go a bit more into depth about your history of motorsport and sort of bits and pieces like that. Is that OK? Sure. Go for it. Great. So let's hit off nice and quick. So how did you actually get into motorsport? Uh, my dad raced. Um, when he was younger back in the 80s and I was always obsessed with driving never really wanted to do anything else other than drive that'll be an astronaut which is weird um and I started karting from a very young age and yeah it kind of just kept going from there uh, ended up uh, doing a scholarship in the UK came second in that and then it just started snowballing from that point on really you didn't fancy going up to space then <laughs> no, I'm too stupid. You need a maths degree and stuff like that, and I'm, I'm not that clever, you see. So, <laughs> so you know, to be fair, driving a car is hard enough, though, definitely. Exactly. <laughs> 
And sort of along your journey and experience, what different barriers have you experienced and how did you actually overcome them? Money is probably the biggest barrier in motorsport, I would have thought. And it, it's a funny one be, because the, the talent level and the money level are two totally separate things. And it, it's, it doesn't mean anything if you're super talented. If there's no budget behind you, it won't work. Um, and it was quickly realizing that results are important, but it's how you can promote the sponsor and what you can do to increase their brand awareness. And I think that was the biggest barrier was lear that learning curve, that it's not all about results, whereas they're important. It's how you can get that sponsor to a higher level with their business. Yeah, I guess that would be it. And then just overcoming all, all kinds of things. Um, obviously, I, I had no prejudice, but I was Irish coming to England. Yeah. And uh, my accent had to change quite quickly. So you can see it that it's changing now. Um, people didn't understand me and that got quite frustrating. People saying pardon and all that. But yeah, I, I suppose, yeah, the barrier is the realization that money counts and you need to find a way to find money or to get money behind you. Yeah. And do you think when you sort of realized that it kind of took off a bit more and a bit more in the right direction? I think it makes you, it's, it, it's a hard pill to swallow. You think everyone wants to be an F1 driver and then you realize, well, it, it's normally somewhere between 10 and 30 million from the point you would ever think you're starting. Yeah. So it makes you have more realistic goals. Well, I, I know I can't get 10, 20 million, but maybe I can get a hundred grand to get into a GT car and maybe I can impress a factory team, things like that. That's kind of, yeah. so it's kind of a leveling moment, but yeah, it helps you move forward, I think. Brilliant, okie dokie. And obviously you've had such a wide range of experience within motorsports. So you've done stunt driving, the car and development driver, Ford 2000. You've um, even coached some F1 drivers. So how do you find all the different variations that you've done have sort of helped one another, but also how are they different? Yeah, um, it's funny because I, I teach a lot of car control to a lot of racing drivers. Mm -hmm. And when I teach it to them, it makes them go quicker. But quite often I find when I get back in a race car, I have to dial the car control back because it actually slows me down because I don't care if the car goes sideways. And if anything, I'll provoke it more because I'm a child. Um, <laughs> whereas most drivers who come to me want to be able to catch a slide and bring the car back into space, in, in, into position. So I guess car control is everything. And it, it, it all stems from confidence in the car. Once you're happy that whatever state the car gets into, you can control it. Then you're more eager to come off the brake early or roll in some more speed or keep your minimums up. Um, so I guess, yeah, um, it, it, it all helps. Uh, vision, vision is key in every single aspect I've done in terms of motorsport or stunt driving or anything. Be it on a film set, you're looking out for other human beings, looking out for your marks, looking out for everything. Being in a race car, you're looking for cars around you. You know, when I'm doing live displays, it's looking for your, you know, your, your timings and all these kind of things. So, you know, they, they all work together, but it's just applying the skill to what you're using it for and making it work for you, not against you. As yeah. in stupid me just sliding the car everywhere and getting given out to. <laughs> Trying to make sense? as sideways as possible. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> no, perfect sense, definitely. And also, what is actually your favorite thing you've done? So out of all the different types of motorsport, which is, would you say is your go-to favorite? I know it's a little side question, but. <laughs> um, again, it's really hard to say because they all have their merits, um, you know, First time you race at Spa is, you know, an unbelievable feeling. Um, the first time you get in a really fast car with aero around Silverstone GP, quite unbelievable. It's, it's such a, a mind boggling experience. You know, maggots and Beckett's in a high powered, high downforce car is, you know, unrivaled anywhere in the world. Um, yeah, sorry, can you say that question again? I, I forget what it was. Wait, so what part about all the different motorsports that you do is your favorite? I guess if you can class it as a motorsport, stunt driving is is what I mainly, mainly do at the minute. It's what's keeping me busiest. Um, I'm still racing and I'm still coaching and I'm still doing displays um, and still doing development work actually. But stunt driving, I find the most challenging and the most rewarding at the minute. Um, yeah. Not to not to take anything away from the others. It's just my personal preference. I'm enjoying stunt driving most of the minute. Yeah. And that leads on to the next question quite nicely. So learning different stunt skills. So I know personally handbrake turns, J, J turns, is it? All the different bits and pieces. So how do all those different stunts help you get faster around the tr track? And can they actually make you get faster around the track? Yeah, absolutely they can. 
Um, like I said, you know, to, to go quick around a track, you need to look for your minimum, so your highest minimum speed. Yeah. So at the apex of the corner, what's the highest minimum you can carry? Now, the way to do that is to come off the brake early and to brake late. Mm. And it, it's a case of confidence building. So when you get better at depending, I mean, some, some stunt skills won't be applicable, but car control, power sliding, these are all very, very useful things because in racing you need rotation in a corner and that rotation is just a, a tiny degree of drifting basically. Um, so it's, it's confidence, I guess, is the main thing and how you can use it. I think one of the biggest things I've taught people and when they've come back and said thank you is um, damage limitation and avoiding a crash or an accident. Definitely. It's putting in the, cause you, when, it, when it's gonna go wrong, you can put in one input and that's it. That one input decides whether or not you're having a crash Yeah. or it decides how big the crash is gonna be. Yeah. So I teach a thing called, um, you know, damage limitation. So it's when the accident is going to happen, what's the one thing you can do to minimize the damage or to make sure a loved one or something is furthest away from the accident if they're next to you? Can you put your side into the wall first or whatever it may be? So, yeah, I think it's, that's kind of a morbid thing to say, but it, it's just having these, this bag of tools, you know, you, you can dip into when you need it. Yeah. Um, in terms of reverse 180s, J-turns and stuff, I, don't know. I guess if you want to get a fine on the racetrack, maybe that's what you can do, but I don't think they're going to be applicable. I was going to say, I've never tried it because I'd be too afraid I'd pull the handbrake and it would just snap. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit of a fear. But no, that's brilliant. So definitely, if you're looking to get quicker around the track, it's worth learning that limit and the confidence for sort of, like you say, you're carrying speed through the corner, your damage limitations, it's all going to help on that racetrack. So essentially. Yeah. Yeah, and it's finding the synergy like between the, the, the three main things are your eyes, your hands, and your feet. Yeah. And they all need to communicate. And nothing makes them talk to each other like precision driving does because it's it's so finite in the little movements you have to do. They all have to be in harmony. Mm -hmm. And they do in racing as well, but you can get away with it in racing more than you can, you know, in a precision environment because the, the, the parameters are so much tighter. Yeah. So. Oh, amazing. Definitely so I'd love to have a go at. I don't know how good Anytime. I can be, but you never know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. So on to the next question. Um, obviously, you've been around motorsport sport for a few years. How do you think it has developed and changed over time, and especially towards females in the area? Um, I think the biggest change I've seen is the talent and the speed of the newer kids. Um, I coach a lot of juniors, and... I don't know. I mean, I ask a lot of my colleagues who are, you know, even far, far higher than I am in this industry in racing. Mm -hmm. And we all agree, like the speed of these kids nowadays is nothing to what we were when we were their age. Mm -hmm. And I think that's down to the fact that the junior categories just didn't exist. You know, you carted up until the point you could get into a Formula Ford or something and then you moved on. But there was never a car you could get into. Yeah. Since like, you know, you got Junior Saxo or Sax Max, you got Ginetta Juniors, you got Junior Fiestas. And these kids are out all the time testing but not only that they've got a coach next to them for every test session when I started I didn't have a coach I had someone sat on a corner watching me and telling me where to go a bit quicker on a feedback but you never had someone from day one sit next to you making it quicker so that's why you see the likes of Lando and Max and George Russell you know they are a new breed of speed now that's making the others look a bit silly yeah so I think that's in terms of that question in terms of females I was never under the impression that there was a big difference in talent between male or female. I, I knew I was coached by Catherine Legg. I was yeah. coached by Susie Stoddart at the time. She's now Susie Wolf. And they were they were quick at the time that I knew them. Um, I'm a male, so I don't know what the prejudice is like. <laughs> I think from from my point of view, from whenever I've driven the highest powered stuff with downforce, it's just the physicality of it. And I wonder, is that just the limitation of it? Is it just the pure physicality? Yeah. Maybe these, if these women are, are talented enough to put it together for 10, 20, 30 laps, yeah. but can they not quite maintain that high level for two hours? I don't, I'm not trying to speak out of turn. I don't know, no, that's no just worries. my opinion. Because I've seen, I've seen how talented they are. You know, you've got like Jamie Chadwick out there. She's ballistic quick. Yeah. And, you know, maybe she'll make F1 and, you know, we'll see. But I think there are a lot more females in, than there were when I was younger but then I got I don't know is that just a case of there's more juniors coming through maybe yeah so with like you say juniors coming through and having like the Janetta juniors and all the different opportunities 
do you think that's then again linking back to money so obviously their parents have the money to put them in the cars with the coaches and help develop them a bit earlier than like you say you could just go karting and teach yourself almost a little bit more yeah without question it's down to money but then also these championships like Jeanette Jr is on live tv yeah on the toka package so the parents, whether they're paying themselves or they have a friend who can sponsor it, it's a lot easier to get that budget together in terms of advertising because it gets live airtime. Um, again, that wasn't something back when my, my races were filmed when I was younger. It was on Motors TV, you know, six months later, <laughs> nine, 11 o'clock at night. So it's, it's not as it was now. So, yeah. but yeah, my, money is crazy. Some of these kids are spending, you know, 150 to 200,000 a year in Genetic Juniors. You know, and it only goes up from there definitely yeah. that's only the baseline <laughs> exactly <laughs> um so moving on what is actually your current aspiration at the moment with motorsport is it to focus more on stunt driving or is there any like little goals you've got yourself to try and achieve yeah i'm opening my own stunt driving academy oh wow yeah so that that is my goal at the minute uh, yeah. i'll always race well, as long as my customers keep me racing with them i'll keep <laughs> racing um but yeah my main goal at the minute is to continue working in film and TV, and then to bring up a new breed. Because the way I see it is this talent pool of young kids coming through racing, I'd like to get that talent pool coming through stunts as well, because yeah. you know this is an industry that talent does make a difference in. And yeah. if you are very, very good, you will be recognized. And not only that, if you show up on a film set, you're getting paid, you're not paying to be there. So I think you know for people who have a passion about driving, this is an avenue to actually have a career out of it. Yeah. Whereas I fear at the minute with racing, it, it's you know, unless you make it to a works team or unless you find a massive sponsor who pays the whole way through, yeah. you know, it's hard to make a career out of it. So I'd like to give these, you know, kids a chance who are very, very talented to come through the academy. It's still going to cost money, but nothing like what they're paying in racing. And it gives a route to market, I think. Definitely. So yeah, that's my main goal. Like you say, there's so many more aspects of motorsport. I think a lot of kids anyway, they focus on the F1 and there's only mm -hmm. 20 drivers on the grid at the end of the day. And there's so many more aspects, like you say, to make money as well as, well as paying for it. Because if you think you've got to have a full-time job and then try and train for your races, do your races, it's a lot to take on. And I don't think a lot of people can sustain it for that long. And obviously they don't want to give up their passion because they have that so much love for it. So why not try and make money out of something you love? Exactly. Because there's the, the world of club motorsport is huge and the racing is just as high a level, if not higher, some would argue, because some of these people club racing have been in it forever. I've done some club races and I've gone into qualifying and there's tents separating 20 cars and you're thinking, oh my God, this is, this is super challenging. But you said, you know, there's 20 drivers in F1. That's 10 teams. Yeah. So it's even less. And most people, you know, who aren't into motorsport only know about F1 or maybe some rallying and that's it. Yeah. It's nothing else. Whereas, you know, there's so many facets of motorsport that you can make money in that it's, you don't want to burst these kids' bubbles and take their dreams away from them, but you also want to try and put them on the right path of reality yeah. to actually give them a shot at it. I'm not trying to take anyone's goals away. You know, you see people making these posts on Instagram, believe, achieve, dream, it'll, it'll come true. It will, if daddy's got a big bank balance and can pay your way through it. <laughs> you know, why not have a realistic goal, get your talent up, get seen, you know, and then get paid to do what you love. Be yeah. an actual professional. That's my, my opinion. Brilliant. And on to the next question. Um, so obviously you've worked with a lot of large motor companies like Carwell and McLaren. And how do you think they are to work with? And are they quite sort of fair towards females? Was there a lot of sort of females in the area or do you think it was quite male dominated? Uh, in terms of TV and production, I've noticed that most of the people in charge on most of the sets I'm on are always female. Of course. <laughs> and, yeah. and we all do what we're told. Organise that. Um, <laughs> in terms of the development that I've worked in, I haven't seen that many females, if I'm honest. Um, I don't know, is that a choice? I don't know. I know quite a few female drivers, um, but they've never spoken to me about wanting to do development. So I don't know. Yeah. I can't say whether there is a prejudice there or not. I just know. <laughs> But certainly on a film set, there's a lot of people way higher than me, way more talented than me, and they're female. <laughs> oh, brilliant. So like you say, there's quite a nice sort of community, like gender doesn't really matter within the film industry then as much. No, not at all. It's, it's irrelevant. It's, it's about getting the, the production done on yeah. time and on budget. 
Yeah. If you can do that, that's cool. If you yeah. can't, you'll be answering to someone who is quite often female. <laughs> <laughs> I like the sound of that. <laughs> I think I think the biggest thing with it is the organization that comes in dealing yeah. with the production. And I just don't think men are capable of that kind of level of organization. I'm <laughs> so, saying yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe that's it. My wife would agree. <laughs> I was say, personal experience, definitely females have that little bit of edge of organized, whereas men tend to be like, oh, we'll sort it 10 minutes before it happens. Yeah, exactly. I think I think on that point as well, it's not just male or female. It, it's, you know, it's all the different uh, communities now. So the, the, the trans area of racing, a very, very close friend of mine, Charlie Martin, um, she's making huge strides in the in the industry and she is an absolute powerhouse and a pioneer in what she does so that's a great thing to see and uh, I was completely ignorant to it until I met Charlie and I actually coached her this is years ago now and we had a drive back from Alton Park and I just said I'm going to ask you every question I can think of <laughs> and she said okay and my eyes were opened yeah and I think a lot of the time what's seen as you know prejudice or homophobia is just more ignorance than anything yeah because people just don't understand or know and they're scared to ask and I, I think from from my point of view that it's great to see that this is becoming a thing you saw Vettel you know wearing the the try or the pride colors and stuff and it's really good to see because it, it's such a, a happy thing to do and I don't know politics and racing should be separate Definitely. but I think if it can be used to raise awareness then that, that's a great thing, I think. Definitely. Politics and I'd have that a 10 best left out of it. <laughs> Absolutely. We're all too stupid to know what's going on anyway, so it doesn't exactly. really matter, does it? <laughs> We're always coming and going with politics. That's half the trouble. You never know what's exactly. happening. <laughs> exactly. Um, so what is actually your favourite memory that you have in motorsport, whether it be a certain film that you've worked on or a certain driver you've coached, anything that sort of stands out to you that you've like, yep, yeah, that's my one favourite memory? Oh, tough one. <laughs> yeah, that is a tough one. <laughs> I think winning my first championship yeah. back in 06, that was, that was a great feeling um, <laughs> because that, that's a, you know, not only do you, you win a race and it's great, but when you win a championship, you've, you know, you've won everything, you know, yeah. and um, that was a great season. I won 12 of 13 races. So, <laughs> Yeah, that was a, a really good feeling. So I guess in terms of, I mean, the achievement, it was, a, it was a little club championship, but it was still my first one to win. Yeah. So I, I'd say that was probably winning the first championship. Definitely. And what was it like with your first ever race win? What was that feeling like? First race win. I think of that. <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm, I'm getting old, Becky. You'll have to bear with me. I'm trying to, <laughs> no, I'm trying to, think, I'm trying to think back. I... I think it was in a Ford, a Formula Ford, I think. And I didn't think I'd won. <laughs> so I think that was it. So I'm, I can't remember what it was in, but mm. I remember not knowing I'd won until afterwards. And then, then telling me. So I actually didn't get the, I didn't take the flag and throw my hand in the air because I didn't realize I'd won. <laughs> because there were so many back markers and we were lapping people and stuff. I had no idea where I was in position. <laughs> <laughs> Which sounds stupid, doesn't it? But I, that, that's pretty much it. So yeah, my first win, I can't really remember. <laughs> So it was a nice little surprise though. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Definitely. So being a driver coach, you've coached people all the way up to current F1 drivers. So what would you say the top three skills are needed to make it as a racing driver? Uh, definitely talent. Yeah. Um, so some of the ones I've seen have been mind-blowingly talented. Mm. So that's really up there because you can have all the money in the world and if you're not good enough, you won't make it because it's, like you said, there are only, you know, 20 drives out there. Yeah. So, and there's more than 20 people with money to do F1. So that is quite a, um, so skill. I think being able to deal with the media and present yourself well, I think we've seen some current F1 drivers making a hash of that <laughs> and not really helping themselves. And it's yeah. in the news all the time. So yeah. being able to deal with PR, I think is massive. And then from my point of view, I think being a genuinely good person. Yeah. That would be mine. And whenever I've coached any of the kids I work with, if they are, if they step out of line or if they're rude to the team or if they're not grateful to the mechanics, I drag them up on it. Yeah. And the parents always let me do it because I don't think they, at that young age, they realize how absolutely um, privileged they are to be in that position, to be able to do that. 
And I think it's really important to keep them level headed because you do see some drivers who have made it who aren't very nice people and it comes across quite quickly. And all that could have been was a little bit of a direction change, you yeah. know, in their career. So I try to do my little bit with that. Definitely. Like I say, when you're younger, you're a bit oblivious to it all, aren't you? And I think, like you say, it's not something that comes, it comes more with experience and like you say, having that little guidance from your peers. Yeah, I remember, I remember I was quite young and I was karting and I had a crap race. And this was the first realization. It was a good lesson for me. And I, the mechanic helped, we put the cart back up on the trolley and we went to walk back um, to the truck. And I went to walk away and he grabbed me, pulled me back and he made me push the cart back. And I didn't even think, and I should have, you know, he was absolutely right to do it, but I, I just walked off. I was in a hump because I had a bad race yeah. and I was just letting my mechanic push the cart yeah. and he was having none of it. And he made me push it back. And, uh, but it was, I've never, and that was, God, you know, probably 28 years ago. And I still remember it to this day. Um, <laughs> so it's important, you know, it, you know, bring you back down to earth. Definitely. So last but not least, what would actually be your best advice for anyone who wants to get into motorsports in general, whether that be stunt driving, racing, just motorsport in general? I think find an angle for sponsorship. Mm. Find a company that you can relate to and you can find a link, no matter how tedious it is, to motorsport. And then find a way that you can elevate their business or drive customers towards them or increase their social media that would be the main one finding that link the second one is take loads of advice and then take the best from all of it yeah don't just listen to one person because a lot of people try, like to impose what they think is right mm -hmm. whereas you should take as much advice as you can um and always no matter what you do always take an opportunity to get in the car and to learn from somebody and always learn and never think you know something definitely um, I, I guess that would be it really. And I think the main thing I've always done as a driver is if I'm off the pace, I always say I'm off the pace and I go back to the team and I let them say to me, is there something in the car we can change for you? And it, you know, even sometimes I knew there was something wrong with the car, but I didn't really want to say it. I said to me and I let the team come and say it was in the car. Cause yeah. if, if as a driver, you always say, oh, this is crap. This car's not doing it. It's under doing it. It's not doing that. If you've done everything you can, to drive that problem out of the car and then come in and tell them there's understeer in the car or there's oversteer or there's, you know, there's a brake issue. You know, you as a driver should find a way to drive through that problem and then come back and ask them to make a change. But don't just come back in kicking and screaming. I think always blame yourself and then move on to the car, I think. Yeah, the a best way to learn. man always blames his tools. Exactly. <laughs> and I know, I know a lot of mechanics, mecha mechanics, yeah. I know a lot of mechanics, they say, um, they have a saying called shaking a bag of spanners. Mm. So they basically pop the bonnet, shake a bag of spanners, close it and say, try that, we've changed something. <laughs> and then the driver comes back saying, yeah, it's perfect. Don't do a thing. I love it. So the yeah. fact. <laughs> exactly. So it's a, it's a mind game. Definitely. Be humble, <laughs> be humble, be grateful. And that's it. That's the end of the 20 questions. We made it. <laughs> there we go. Victory. So, yeah. So thank you ever so much for coming on and chatting to me tonight. I hope it wasn't too scary or not no, scary. No, I managed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was fine. Thank you. Brilliant. But again, thank you ever so much for coming on. So you guys know we're back here every Monday at 6 p.m. And you guys know the drill. So like, follow, subscribe to make my journey your journey. And I'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs>